Welcome to this podcast on digital responsibility. There's a vibrant community across the world at the moment driving forward corporate digital responsibility, which includes a range of aspects from digital ethics, digital for the environment, sustainability, digital well-being, inclusion, accessibility and more. My name is Rob Price, one of the founders of Corporate Digital Responsibility back in 2017. If you'd like to know more, have a look at the website corporatedigitalresponsibility.net. Welcome to the second episode of season four of the Digital Responsibility Podcast. I'm delighted tonight to be joined by Emma Kisby, CEO of Kogo. Emma, welcome and tell us a bit about yourself and Kogo. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, I actually have a background in customer data analytics, which uh, for most people would send them off to sleep at most dinner parties. But basically, it was all about how do you use customer data to influence and encourage people to spend more? And that's what I spent a big chunk of my career doing. And there came a point in my career which kind of ethically and responsibly, I thought, I don't know if this is quite right. There must be a way that we can use that data for good. And I met Ben, who was the founder of Kogo and um, open banking had really just come into the UK. And there was a real opportunity to think about how you match spend data with kind of sustainability data sets, like for example, carbon emissions, and think about how you can help empower consumers to understand the impacts of their spend. And that's how I ended up joining Kogo. And um, I've been with them over two years and helping them scale the business. And I see that you've um, been all over the press as well recently with a series of um, announcements in terms of those relationships. So um, where are they at the moment? How, how's that early work started? So it's been really interesting because um, back in May 2020, we launched a carbon footprint tracker as an app. And um, the idea was to get people to link their bank accounts. You know, you could link any bank account and then kind of help them understand. So spend and carbon emissions correlate very closely so you can get an understanding of your carbon footprint. But what became abundantly clear as a startup is we were looking to scale up that proposition and we got loads of people downloading it to start off with. But what was great was that open banking initiative was we were able to show real innovation to the big banks. And there were lots of big banks out there making big commitments uh, in terms of driving to a low carbon economy, the likes of the likes of NatWest, and then looking for solutions. So we were able to extend all our functions, features, learnings, insights, and look at how we could build that into their mobile banking proposition. So um, in line with COP26 back in November, we launched the first integrated carbon footprint tracker into the NatWest mobile banking app. Um, and we've been working with the likes of Santander and TSB and lots of other banks, um, really helping them on this sustainability journey and bringing these tools to their customers. It's interesting because um, I had a series of, in previous life um, when I was CEO of a payment, UK payments business. Uh, we had a, all sorts of conversations around open banking and the benefits uh, for uh, banking were kind of perhaps more obvious in some ways than the benefits for the end consumer. And it was one of the real struggles was to kind of say, why should they care? But actually, here's something where they've got a reason to care because they're, you're delivering extra value for them, extra insight to help them on their journey to work out what best to do for them. What consumer feedback have you had so far? It's really positive. I think it's a very new space. And um what we hear consistently is consumers say, look, we're desperate to do something. There's been some lots of surveys. I mean, Forbes would, kind of came out with a stat which like 68% of consumers want to make a difference and are looking to business to help them be more ethical and sustainable. And we're seeing that because when people actually see their own carbon footprint, it really helps them understand their own personal impact. I mean, we talk about this kind of phrase, which is quite common, which is like, you can't manage what you can't measure. And actually what we find is that the climate crisis feels like a very big problem and we as individuals feel very small and it's like really does my does my actions make a difference or do my actions make a difference and of course they do everyone's actions because once you take an individual action and then you put all those individual actions together it can be incredibly powerful so um we are seeing that customers are looking more and more for tools and solutions to help them take an active role in what is what was a kind of conceptual issue that people were like, oh, that climate crisis does or doesn't. And now it's like, wow, I can actually feel and see the impacts of the climate crisis and I need to do something. It strikes me that as people do something on the back of that insight and do change things, that actually you'd get a view about that in the context of the data that, that ultimately you would sense. I mean, take, take me from a personal example. I stopped eating meat two years ago. Um, and and therefore I probably buy less meat than I did 
before. Do you, is it something that you see downstream of hard to early days now, but downstream, would you be able to get some insight as to consumer change behaviour driving for a more sustainable outcome? Or is, is, that, is that too far uh, forward, I guess? No, I think um, long term benefit is a bit too far, but short term, definitely. So we ran a few pilots and we published the results on our pilot with NetWest and, and we saw about 37% of users actually commit to a new action or an action, 60% of those are actually new, um, to commit to reducing their carbon emissions. One of the big challenges with people taking action is they don't get this kind of positive reinforcement. And what's interesting from my old world is kind of behavioural science and where that comes back. And what's interesting is that when people take action, they want that recognition and that feedback to say, yeah, that's good. And people are very reluctant to move on to another action unless they really get that feedback. So the kind of what we're doing is looking at combining data and kind of behavioral science principles to, to make sure that we're encouraging sustained behavioral change. So, you know, for example, by you going to vegan, vegetarian, vegan, especially, you can actually reduce your, your carbon emissions by around 25%. You know, it's a significant amount. And the reality of that is that people need to feel that and see that to keep that momentum going. So, yes, we're seeing people commit to it, but the test is then that over time. And we'll see that next year as we kind of see that data continuing and how people keep their, their behaviours changed. So, so I think just worth mentioning in the context of corporate digital responsibility, I mean, there are a couple of principles where the work that you're doing absolutely aligns both in terms of um, enabling people to understand uh, the environmental impact that their behaviours have uh, and, and therefore how to mitigate it, but also linking it into some of the economic kind of pieces um, in terms of um, prompting uh, or driving consumer changes of behaviour. I suppose in that regard, and, and the example you just gave with the vegan uh, decision is, is, is a great one. But what would the top kind of three, four, five things be based on the work that you've been doing so far that any of us should really be thinking about front of mind if we wanted to really make positive personal impact? Yeah, so um, the first thing I think what people don't understand is every pound you spend has an impact. So actually, the first thing you can do is actually look at what you're spending and do you need to spend it? You know, we live in a world of disposable consumerism. And actually, when you look at our carbon footprints, is very linked to this kind of overconsumption. So actually, one of the things is like, how can you actually spend less? How can you, you kind of be more ethical and sustainable and really think about, do you need it? You know, we talk about reuse, recycle, repair. There's other ways that you can go about, you know, buying secondhand. I've got two kids, you know, kind of like, I didn't need to buy as many toys as I did when they were younger. You can buy secondhand, that kind of area. So I think really thinking at kind of at the high level in terms of, do you need to spend as much? The set, there's kind of then probably four key areas after that. The big one is obviously energy and your energy usage in terms of making sure that your energy is renewable energy and being really energy efficient. That's a big contributor to your household emissions. Um, food that you mentioned is another big kind of uh, driver of people's carbon emissions, both in terms of your diet, but also waste. Um, it's kind of worth kind of kind of highlighting that. Fashion is another one in terms of fast fashion and not in terms of just buying secondhand, but also all that that fashion that then gets thrown out obviously goes back into landfill and, you know, you get the kind of contributing factors there. And then transport, but kind of clearly flying. So, you know, one long haul flight is the equivalent of pretty much, you know, half of your carbon emissions, depending on where you're going. But that of your annual carbon footprint, that's a massive amount. So it's not saying, I mean, sometimes it can feel quite punitive. You know, it's like, really, this doesn't sound much fun. But actually, it's just being more responsible. And I found personally that I've just become much more conscious about the way I consume, which is what we talk about, conscious consumption. Absolutely. And I guess awareness of, of consumerism becomes so important and that you can live um, a sustainable life and a happy life at the same, same time. You can make positive decisions. Um, it seems like a really exciting idea to me. And as I was uh, taking a look at it before the podcast, it seemed to me that um, there must be so many organisations that could benefit from, from bringing that insight to the consumer, including those people selling the, the, the food or, or providing the transport, and that they'd have the chance to actually say, um, you could choose that product over that product because that's going to help you to make more sustainable decisions. 
are you seeing any interest in the market of the providers rather than the, the, um, the banks that can tell you about your spending, those organisations that can help you spend better at the point of purchase? Yeah, so there's a couple of dynamics I'd probably talk about there. One is there are a lot of amazing businesses being born out of the challenge of sustainability. So, you know, to to kind of name a few, there's kind of, you know, food, food restaurant recycling where you can go and get cheap, you know, people like Karma or um, in terms of recycling um, computers, uh, recon, just, just some really cool businesses that are coming out of this issue. You know, there's a I can't remember the name of the brand, but there's a brand that makes swim shorts for kids and actually they extend them as the kids grow older, as opposed to you buying new ones. It's just really clever. You know, fashion rental is massive. You know, if I'd have known about fashion rental 10, 15 years ago, maybe more when my friends were getting married, gosh, that would just have been a a big um, impact for me. So I think that there are a lot of amazing businesses. And also you're then seeing collaborations like amazing collab, like Beyond Me collaborating with McDonald's. You know, who would have thought that would ever happen? And Allbirds collaborating with Adidas. And so there's this interesting kind of dynamic going on. But then to your question about then the the kind of big retailers and, and kind of distributors or grocers, et cetera. We're seeing a lot now of uh, the grocers, for example, really leading. So in Denmark, Co-op, I think, was one of the first businesses to start doing carbon labelling on shelves. We're seeing that becoming common practice. People are talking about traffic labelling. So Little came out and kind of talking about that. Uh, Unilever have talked about carbon labelling. And I think these are all great because we're going to see a lot more transparency. There was a business over in Italy I was talking to someone about the other day that has digital IDs in their clothes that shows the whole carbon footprint of their whole supply chain. You know, so I think as consumer awareness and impatience in this area grows, responsibility of businesses is growing. But also I think people are recognizing that we all have a role to play. You know, we can't just wait for the government to decide to do something. You know, consumers have a role to play around being more conscious about their consumer. Businesses have a role to play in terms of transparency and, and showing uh, consumers where products are coming from and the impact that they have. Um, the, the thing that I wanted to touch on there, because you've talked about a lot about um, the carbon impact at that point, and, and it's typically the main part of the conversation with so many people uh, relating to the payments that you made. Um, but you also touched earlier on uh, waste, and there's a number of other aspects from an environmental kind of perspective. Uh, resource scarcity. I mean, kind of. I, I, I try. I'm trying to buy an uh, an electric car at the moment, but mm. I've got to wait a year for it to arrive because kind of the 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 impact uh, from supply chain on builds, uh, biodiversity, etc. So, are you are you focused primarily on carbon, or are you also beginning to open up that clarity around some of the other aspects of the environmental impact for people? Uh, It's a really good question, Rob. So we actually started when we um, started testing out the idea about matching sustainability data and spend data, we actually started with living wage data. So actually showing people the proportion of their spend on living wage businesses. And it was really interesting because straight away we got lots of people downloading. So we get a lot of people who are kind of very conscientious and, and kind of what we call dark greens, who are kind of there and very aware about things like living wage, absolutely loved it it was very difficult to shift behavior because they were like, oh, that's interesting. You know, I've got about two, 5% of my overall spends going on living wage businesses. But the reality is, is sadly, there aren't lots of living wage businesses. And actually what we found are people like, that's nice to know. And now that I know that I have shifted my behavior, they choose one pub over another, for example. And we saw that through the data, but there wasn't enough. And what, what we found is that actually what people then were really excited about was carbon footprints. And the businesses were excited. So what we looked at is then, okay, well, let's move this on to the next stage of carbon footprints. But it's not just about that. Within our app, you'll probably see that we actually badge businesses according to what they're accredited for. And there are there are so many different accreditation certifications that it becomes quite confusing for, for everyone to understand, well, what, you know, what's, I don't know, the soil association, what does that actually mean? What's the carbon trust doing? And how's that different from a low carbon product? You know, it gets quite confusing if you're not in it. So we just aggregated all these kind of certifications. We pulled them all together and put them into a simple badging framework. So we just said, look, this is a socially responsible business. And and these are the accreditations that stack, or or this is um, cruelty free, or this is an organic business. Because what we also know from many years, we started off as a charity 10 years ago, What we know from working with consumers and businesses, it's also quite personal. So some people really care about carbon footprints. Other people really care about people being paid equally. And other people really care about diversity and and encouraging minority-run businesses, for example. Um, So it's 
it's not quite as simple as just being linked to carbon. Plus the other dynamic, which I think really did come through at COP and people understood was this idea about a just transition. So it's not just about carbon, it has to be done, you know, the kind of social justice and the climate crisis are intrinsically linked. So no, we're not just about carbon, but the solutions that we kind of have been kind of working on have been very relevant to carbon because of this drive to a low carbon economy. But we're also looking at other areas such as waste, I talked about plastics, water, etc. I, I really like your point about badging. Um, on an earlier uh, podcast, we talked to Ninian uh, from the Swiss Digital Initiative, and they're using a badging system for giving people greater confidence in their ability to trust how a website uses data. Uh, so it's around privacy and safety. And, and, and it, was, it was really simple to kind of say, look, it's, it's kind of gold standard, silver standard, bronze standard, because they too had kind of tried to simplify the various um, standards, policies, regulations that existed into a way that kind of gave people faith and trust. Um, the, the, one of the complexities with that, of course, is that when you start talking on a global level, there are so many different kind of standards across different countries um, to try and take into account. Um, I suppose that kind of leads to my, my next question, which is uh, how far are you, have you taken this so far? So we've talked about UK banks, but what's the intent uh, beyond the boundaries of the UK? So Ben, our founder, is in New Zealand. So we work out in New Zealand. We have launched something similar out in Australia. Uh, we're working with one of the banks out there. Um, and, uh, and in other markets, we're kind of in live conversations at the moment. Um, I think the reality is, is it does need to be market specific, typically. Um, I think, as you said, you know, it, it's really complex. It's not, I worked years ago at Tesco when we were talking about traffic lighting, you know, in terms of kind of from a, an obesity perspective, and, and then the labeling was brought in on food to show this is like red, amber, green. It's not that simple when it comes to businesses, because there are so many dynamics, you know, you, this might be brilliant at reducing waste, but might not you know, be paying living wage, you know, so how do you, you can't really traffic light it. So, that's why these standards, there is um, some ability, I think, to create global standards, but I think we're way off that. I think at the moment, just trying to make it as simple as possible with the information out there is the first step. And I think getting that greater transparency, and we talk a lot about uh, market, the market information asymmetry. So, you know, businesses are looking to embrace kind of social responsibility and, and kind of be more ethical, sustainable, but then it's really difficult for them to convey that to customers because it's not it's hard to be transparent and then customers don't know businesses are doing it so the whole market is kind of out and we're trying to kind of balance that out with just some simple standards so we are in early stages of it we've been doing it in the uk we know that customers really like it because then it cuts through a lot of business you know a lot of the noise for them but equally it's not that straightforward and actually what we're looking for is more collaboration and, and looking at kind of how we can create a framework. So in lots of interesting discussions with other people like us, with governments, kind of about how we can help kind of create this framework. So we create real transparency for consumers and businesses. And I think it's, it's often around connecting all the dots. We often talk around, I mean, going back to Christopher's uh, point around how, how do you let the merchant know? So what value is there in the merchant for uh, the knowledge that they can get as part of that payment transaction and, and, and better, uh, engaging with consumers in the way that kind of they can do in a more effective way. Um, how do organisations know about organisations like yourself? Uh, it's one of the kind of conversations that crops up time and time again, because there is, as you say, a very dynamic space at the moment around the whole clean tech, eco tech space. But you have to be part of it to kind of know some of the gems that are hiding within that to be able to then wrap them in, in, in the supply chain of the large, larger organization. Um, I, I guess, are there any lessons that you've got from your engagement with the banks for other organizations similar to yourself trying to make a difference in this field um, to drive their better ability to engage and have a greater impact? What, what tips would you give others? I mean, they're probably not new news, Rob, um, sadly. I mean, it was a lot of hard graft and a lot of knocking on doors. But I think the key thing that we quickly identified was that um, in the case of for us to kind of scale and grow and let awareness, 
unless we were going to have a massive marketing budget, which was highly unlikely given we're a small startup, we had to find some way of collaborating. And collaboration comes up time and time again. And I will point to it because you you have seen some amazing collaboration. Mm -hmm. But the problem with collaborating is like, who? why would they want to work with you? It's very obvious why you as a startup want to work with them. And I think where we um, were really able to cut through is identifying a problem and a need for the banks. Um, you know, they needed a solution and they need some expertise. And we were able to do that and we had to adapt certain areas. So, you know, you have to be able to be comfortable pivoting and being flexible, but also protecting kind of what is your in terms of your assets. So, you know, you still want to be able to scale and grow as a business. So I think the key things for us were identifying the need finding areas then that we could pivot in terms of our core product and being able to service that up to the banks and then thinking around what was really important for us and when we really kind of looked ourselves in the eyes I think the key thing we really wanted to achieve was scale and impact and the only way that we were going to deliver scale and impact in terms of on these big kind of climate issues was by working with businesses that had scale um, customer bases and so for for us we kind of then had a bit of like what's their need but actually what do we want to achieve and then kind of then how far are we prepared to flex our core proposition which at the time was an app and now we have more of a b2b solution in terms of an api so i think it's it's being prepared to kind of flex and pivot but doing it within the parameters of what you want out of a business you know as a startup um and and Whilst I find it astonishing, I've, we find ourselves at the beginning of 2022 already. Um, so, so how about looking forward for the rest of the the year? What what are the main things on your uh, wish list that you would hope to see uh, evolve this year, both for you as a business, but actually also for that broader piece, which is how do people kind of, as a whole, as a society, think more in the context of the impact that they can have on the environment? So one of the really exciting things um, that we found as a business was going up to COP26. And I know it, it was pretty chaotic, some aspects of it. But the reality was, if you looked at then the media, suddenly everyone's talking about kind of sustainability, the climate crisis, carbon footprints. And actually, they're not just talking about it at a high level, but they're actually going into what are the tools and solutions. Consumers, I would say carbon literacy, really um, grew in that period like yeah I always call out my mum and I feel bad because you know I talked to my mum I was like I don't understand what you do I don't understand what carbon footprints and then going through cops suddenly the BBC are talking about it and she's like oh okay that's oh, I get it oh this guy Mike Berners-Lee doesn't he you should work with him I'm like, we do mum oh brilliant you know so I think there was just a general awareness in COP26 around not just that there is a problem but oh there are tools out there and there are solutions and actually there are things that we can do so Looking forwards, I, I hope and believe that we are going to see an increase in the carbon literacy. I think we're going to see an increase in innovation and tools and solutions, especially with some of the regulatory pressures coming out that will put pressure on businesses to really then say, right, what can we do to help people be ethical and sustainable? And then ultimately, I think we'll see more collaboration and the need for kind of more transparency and measurement. I think those are the key things that I hope for uh, and, um, and yeah, I wish for. I wish for and hope for. And and um, the trends that we're seeing at the end of last year, I hope will continue in that, in that vein. And reflecting on what you've been discussing there, Emma, um, I, I'm seeing parallels with what we've seen in the world of digital responsibility in other domains as well, as, as we've often reflected that uh, companies, the consumer government should be more aware of the impact that they can have on the world um, in in a negative sense, in the world of technology and how things can go wrong and how people need to be aware of those things. And we need to be able to hold organizations to account for their, their um, behaviors and responsibilities in that domain. Um, and we've always looked at, looked at the environmental world and says, um, we, we wish um, consumers were as aware of it and, and um, going on the same journey. Um, who do you see driving the business biggest change at the moment? Do you see it as governments based in, in, in the world of COP and, and those organizations? Do you see it as a clean tech niche organizations like yourselves or, or the, the large organizations uh, that your customers or indeed the consumers? Who's really pushing the change towards um, this new world that we're leading towards? So um, the honest answer is everyone is. And I think... Um, I think there is a kind of bit of awakening that 
the climate crisis is someone else's problem. And actually, I think you're seeing this awakening of, oh, there's no one coming to rescue us. Like we all need to do something. And you know, the, the government is making positive actions. They are taking positive actions. Um, and they have various pressures and they're busy. You see businesses stepping up to the plate. You see kind of small businesses coming through. You see consumers. And I think I talk a lot about collaboration, but I think I work in a very unique environment where we will collaborate with our competitors. And that's very uncommercial. But I think there is a reality, which is we have to find a way of working through solutions to this because this isn't a short term. So this is a long term problem that is going to have a very real impact on us and we have to do something about it. So I do see that I don't see one one entity saving us on this. It's everyone and it's everyone moving with pace, I think, is the big thing. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, I, th I think that's all we've got time for this week. Emma, thank you so much for, for you joining us on the podcast. It's been fascinating to hear about your experiences so far with your with Kogo and your ambitions for the year ahead. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much. It's been interesting hearing the parallels as well. I'm sure that there's yeah. a lot to learn from you. So maybe we'll do a podcast next time. You can come and chat with us and tell us all your secrets. <laughs> Absolutely. Sounds good. We'll look forward to it. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.